Okay. Okay. It asked you to click yes for the recording. So yes. anything you say can and will be used against you in a court. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, folks, my name is Jessica Mashkovich, and this is One Take with Jess. That's my intro that I do. Um, today, my guest is Bob Somerville. Bob and I go probably a decade back. He is a freight forwarder, customs broker, man extraordinaire. I have relied on him for almost a decade, I, I think, to bring my inventory from overseas into the United States, clearing it through customs, arranging trucking, you know, answering all of my questions about import, export, global shipping, what the heck's going on in this world. Um, and uh, I brought him here today to talk about things that, that have come up in conversation, like why are my chicken wings so expensive? This is all related to the supply chain. So welcome to the podcast, Bob. Thank you for taking the time and putting on a sweater for us today. <laughs> yes. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Um, so you are always my go-to person when all of a sudden I see that I can't create inventory to bring into the United States for the cost of my container used to be like $2,000 and now it's over $20,000 just for the container that's not filled with any inventory yet. So you're my first go-to and I call you, I'm like, Bob, what is going on in this world? And then you usually explain it to me. And it's so enjoyable to chat with you because you seem to be able to encapsulate it very well. So I thought that for the benefit of people also wondering about supply chain, you could talk to us a little bit about maybe how this happened and what the heck's going on and is there a bright future ahead? Yes, well, of course, um, you know, as we all know, the pandemic, COVID struck China approximately uh, 2000, uh, March, uh, January of 2020. Um, so it hit there first before obviously it came to the United States. Factory shut down. Uh, orders were still uh, produced and shipped. Uh, so during the pandemic, there was still freight that was coming in. So when people thought it was the, you know, the uh, everything was going to get locked up, no cargo was going to be coming in. Merchandise had already been produced shipped on you know on the water and arriving into the united states i per se were very very busy uh at the height of the pandemic in march or april um I, you know individuals would say to me oh your business must have been affected it was not we were um probably the busiest that we've ever been in my history here so um, that, talk to me about that because that was the very beginning of the pandemic china already knew that something was going on in their own country it was also the chinese new year so there's there's a shutdown of chinese factories anyway during the chinese new year so right. it might have been it might not have been fully understood or felt here that china manufacturing was taking a little bit of a hiatus because that's what they kind of do anyway so you were still very busy as containers were coming in. Why were you extra busy during that time? Well, we were we were also doing a lot of PPP products, um, you know, okay. uh, face masks, uh, sanitizers, uh, hospital gowns, face shields, uh, a lot of our uh, textile accounts. Um, nobody was was buying wearing apparel. Wearing apparel just wasn't coming in. So the textile industry. Uh, factories um, in China that were producing the textiles jumped on the bandwagon producing, you know, the PPP products. So they PPE, obviously, yeah, yeah, well, they're tradespeople and they sold to their uh, apparel companies. Right. Uh, you know, I actually had the opportunity. My my guy in China had sent me um, some links for PPE and also links for the PCR test for COVID. And yeah. I was like, what, what do you mean? We're not going to need this. And, and how am I going to get this through customs? It'll be stopped at, you know, at the border, not at the border, at the gate. And it wouldn't, I'm like, the government could also take it because it's like a medical product that's needed right now. So it was a very weird time for me. I actually could have been one of those people bringing in a container of essential items or more, a bunch of containers. 
And to know that they had the PCR test ready to go, it was a finger prick test where you just put a dot of blood. I saw the video when he sent it over to me. And it was so dirt cheap and yet expensive at the same time, because of course they're charging us in the United States for this stuff. Um, but it's so strange to know that they had those tests ready to go and all the PPE ready to go. And I just was unsure if I would even be able yeah. to import that. Well, it was again, because it, China had already gone through it yeah. um, in January and early, uh, early February. Uh, hand sanitizers were uh, a very troublesome item to bring in. We had many clients bring this product in. Um, they had to uh, be approved by food and drug, new drug application. The masks were okay. The gowns, of course, were okay and the face shields. But anything that was touching your skin, a, uh, again, the, the hand sanitizers, um, unless you purchase from a factory in China that had already uh, received new drug application approval from food and drug, you weren't getting released from FDA. You know, therefore, it was going to be refused and would have to be destroyed and shipped back to uh, to China. Wow. But, uh, were these new things that had come up? Were these new um, requirements well, these were, that came up? Uh, or these, were, these were tradespeople that, you know, nobody was doing business. You know, the wearing apparel industry was, was done. And, um, you know, so were their tradesmen. And they said, oh, you know, we're going to bring this in. They, you know, made propositions to companies like Amazon, so on and so forth. And, um, you know, and didn't realize, um, you know, full detail what needed to be done with this product, you know, that it needed to be registered with FDA. You know, we, we delivered many, many uh, face coverings to uh, distribution centers all throughout the United States. We were, uh, clients of ours were flying them in. Uh, we had four or five flights a day coming in, uh, full truckloads, uh, picking up these masks and delivering them to distribution centers. Um, the so hand were, there were no emergency authorization approvals for certain there, things well, that were there coming was, in, like the well, hand sanitizers? Not, not the hand sanitizers. Uh, the mask, yes. Uh, the, uh, was it the N95 masks? I believe they were. Those need to be registered. Just your basic mask that you saw people wearing. Um, there was no restrictions. You know, you could bring them in and, you know, the uh, food and drug released them and that, that was it. So that, that went pretty well. It was very, um, uh, it was very volatile. There was a lot of, a lot of shipments coming in every day. It was a stressful time. But that was, um, you know, going back again, so now with China, China starts to ship. Um, they finish their productions. Of course, they get hit with the pandemic. A lot of the factories closed down anyway, even before the Chinese New Year. Uh, but cargo again was on the water and freight was coming in. So we, we were quite busy. Uh, we deal with a lot of food products here, um, clearance, you know, through U.S. Customs and Food and Drugs. So um, as they say, a food product is a very defensive item. It does not matter what the economy is. Uh, people are going to eat, um, and we do a lot of uh, frozen seafoods, uh, rice. Uh, it's a very defensive product, rice. Um, so there was there was a lot of merchandise that was coming in food products, and again, because it was uh, these orders were placed uh, and they were shipped. Um, you know, when uh, the pandemic hit here in the United States, so it, obviously the, the the carriers were not going to turn the freight around. Now. Was there any the priority to perishables? Like you just said, frozen seeds. Perishables, yeah. Perishables are uh, top priority. Um, it's like, like a normal container where you have four or five days to pick up the container from the pier. Once it becomes available, offloaded off the vessel or on the chassis, uh, refrigerated cargo or perishable cargo, container cargo, you have two days to uh, take the container off the pier. Otherwise, uh, storage starts to incur and it's it's quite pricey. It's, it's more expensive than a fancy hotel room in Manhattan. <laughs> you can go five to $600 a day on a refrigerated container. So, yeah, I would assume that that should be tended to immediately. Um, anyway. Yeah. So, okay. When did you see things start to go awry after, you know, you saw a Probably wave of wonderful business I, coming in? I, um, uh, in the fall, of uh, 2020, uh, bookings became very, very difficult. Um, as the, yeah, bookings, you know, uh, booking containers in China, you know, to the United States, uh, space 
was was at a bare minimum, you know, and there was there was no space. And of course, uh, space uh, supply and demand sets the the price. Now, um, the freight rates started to escalate uh, because uh, you know you had to pay space allocation fees. So now I want to I want to point out. So there's a lot of a lot of people in 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 the import industry or just the normal Joe turns on the TV and says they're talking of the news and and how uh, how escalated the freight rates are. I'd like to point out that the carriers. So as a freight forwarder myself, if I was to book a container and the total ocean freight cost was twenty thousand dollars. Okay, I was really only paying the steamship line probably $13,000 here in the United States. The uh, dif difference of $7,000 was basically extortion money. It was under the table money. It was money that had to be wired back overseas to China to my representatives and my agents and to pay the booking agents uh, mm -hmm. in order to secure space. So and is that because they knew that whoever is the highest bidder, basically the highest talk, payer? Yeah. Yes. And, you know, I had clients calling me and say, oh, when I, you know, I have 300 containers I'd like to book through volume. And I'd say, unless you're going to pay space allocation fee, you're not going to get any containers on. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Home Depots and the Walmarts of the world, from, from what I understand, that they were starting to charter their own vessels. Mm -hmm. Okay, they had so much freight, um, and they were bringing, you know, bringing full contain, you know, full tri um, ships themselves. Um, so people have been misled by this. Uh, I'm not the first person to defend the steamship line because uh, they'll rob you blind. But uh, with all due respect to them, that they were not charging twenty thousand. So, yeah, I mean, they have been getting a, a bad rap because they've been sitting in the middle of the ocean with like tons of containers on them. And I don't know who's, you know, uh, who's where the gap is between the unloading of them and then getting them back to China. So, yeah, you're right. The steamship liners have been taking a little bit of the heat for that. Yeah, they have. And, um, you know, um, just as in every holiday shipping season, uh, peak seasons. You know, in July and August is the, you know, historically is the peak shipping season for the holiday items that are coming in, you know, for September, early October. Um, as space becomes tight, the carriers jack up their rates. So uh, space on vessels were very, very tight because factories started producing goods again. There were contracts that were outstanding that needed to be completed. And of course, the economy in the United States, you know, things started opening back up again. You know, people started going out and, and, uh, and then all of a sudden there's a big influx. We need product, we need product, we need product because we went, you know, three, four months of, you know, on the low, you know, people weren't going out, durable goods weren't being purchased. Um, and all of a sudden that things you know, starts to go. So yeah, no and even before that, during the pandemic, all of a sudden there was a run on blenders and cooking supplies. People were having to cook at home and there was fitness and gym equipment and they were having to work out at home and home improvement because and home office stuff. So things that were uh, planned for by the companies like this is our last year, what we did and the year before that, what we did. So inventories, planned inventories became scarce. And there's a run on how can we make more? And then there's, you know, shortages all around, starting even with the raw materials side of things. Yes, there was uh, quite a bit. So again, so now uh, there was a, there has been a lull. Uh, the freight rates have gone down, but um, uh, I'm sorry to say as of today, this morning, I booked a 45 foot container from Ningbo to New York at the, uh, the uh, rock bottom cost of $23,000. Again, I will remind everyone it used to be about two thousand dollars, maybe twenty yeah, five hundred. Forty well, a forty five footer, probably prior to the pandemic, was it's the largest container of forty five, so it, it could have been maybe thirty eight hundred dollars. But twenty footers were were about two thousand. A forty footer could be twenty eight hundred to two thousand dollars. 
I hope it was uh, an HQ. I hope it gave a little bit more headroom yeah. up there. Well, it's not just, you know, it's not just China. Uh, you know, we do a lot of product from, uh, from Thailand. So Thailand's main um, or chief export is, um, is textiles, uh, latex, uh, and rice. Um, mm -hmm. So we do quite a bit of rice from Thailand and uh, the, a 20 foot container from Thailand uh, currently right now is about seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 a container. It's more, the, the freight cost is more than the physical cost of the, of the container of rice. So a Absolutely. 20 foot container is about $15,000 for the cost of the material. And then you're gonna tack on another $17,000 um, in freight costs. So now you can only imagine uh, what a 25 pound bag of rice that uh, a normal consumer would purchase at a price club, mm -hmm. okay? Um, a restaurant, for example, um, they're paying double. You know, they are. So that's, um, that's actually a good point because who ends up footing the bill for it? Companies have to continue. Some companies have to continue bringing in inventory. So the costs are going to be passed on to the consumer or businesses are taking much less margin is which scenario is the more likely scenario. The consumer is paying more. Any, yeah. any, my clients, importers, and I speak to them often over this and they tell me that they have to, um, you know, they have to increase their prices. So now here is a product, again, a food item, which is a defensive item. Okay. Uh, in the United States, you look at the cost of beef. Mm -hmm. okay? Beef is, but people are still going out and they're purchasing okay? mm -hmm. because they want to eat. But now the cost of, a sweater like myself, beautiful sweater. Maybe it was twenty dollars when I bought it. Now it's sixty dollars. Is you know is the average Joe going out now and buying a sixty dollars sweater or they're putting food on the table? I mean, you know it depends. There's uh, you know it, it, different commodities uh, are, are not you know affected. You know as again, food is a very very defensive item. Um, even alcohol. Um, during the pandemic, people uh, you know, staying at home drinking. Um, alcohol consumption during the pandemic was uh, sky high, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, not I knew going that my husband can't get his drink that he usually gets. It's Blanton's um, and it's very few and far between. The alcohol distributors have limited the restaurants to like one or two bottles where normally Perfect. they would just be fully stocked. You'd get a case of Blanton's and now it's kind of like hard to come by. Um, yeah. Um, it's difficult, but, um, you it know, is. even wearing apparel accounts, they have, they have slowed down. Um, who's benefiting? Like, who is this not hurting? I, I assume the larger well, businesses uh, like the Walmart. Well, uh, Target. My, my, well, my, well, it's, it's hurting the consumer, right? The American consumer. Well, besides for that, like the size of the business, does the size matter in that case? Are they having less effect? Um, like, for example, if they're importing 350 containers versus, you know, me who would import three to four containers in one fell swoop, who, who is, um, do economies of scale end up benefiting the larger players and continue you know, hurting the smaller players in these circumstances? Or is it that the 300 containers that the larger players are trying to pull in are, they're the ones that are being held up and maybe the smaller guy can weasel their way in with their containers? There's no, from what I've seen, there's no advantage for any by size. Mm. So everybody's suffering. Uh, this is the reason why you know, again, the Walmarts and the Home Depots of the world have charted their own vessels because, you know, that people tell me, well, you know, uh, I have a friend of mine, you know, he deals with the, you know, Walmart or Home Depot and, and you know, they, they're, they're getting freight rates for five, six thousand dollars and they're not getting freight rates for five, six thousand dollars. They're paying the same thing as everybody else. Contracts, okay, um, contracts basically that, individual signs with steamship lines. I hate to say it became null and void. Um, mm -hmm. Again, there was rate increases and everything in contracts. Um, they'll give you a base rate on your contract, but um, 
you know, it, it's subject to general rate increase. So if the carrier mm-hmm. goes ahead and said, okay, well, the base rate was $3,500 and now the rate's going up and we're considering a general rate increase in their contract, it's acceptable. It's, it's, in, the, it's in the clause and saying that you may be subject to a general rate increase. Okay. Uh, again, going back now with the, um, the, um, the, the uh, allocation, space allocation fee, that is not even considered a freight charge. That is just basically just money under the table to get your container on the vessel. Right. And I, I believe I may have spoken to you yesterday about this. The amount of money that has left the United States, okay, stimulus money issued by the American government to American people to help people out um, because prices have, have skyrocketed, okay, there has been so much of that stimulus money that has left the United States and has gone back overseas to China. Okay. So to and, manufacture items? Is this to well, help no, businesses no. stay afloat? What is this for? Well, no. Allocation. Fee. One second. Just going to pause for one sec. Okay. I had to take so a as, So, as I was saying, so space allocation fee, that money is paid in China. Mm-hmm. So, per- example with my office my agent would if it was seven thousand dollars my agent would bill me seven thousand dollars i would collect it from my client here in the united states and i'd have to pay transfer the money overseas to china right did your rates go up as well because your services were more in demand is it your uh, supply and demand my, thing? my services did not go up unfortunately I, I kept my rates basically the same the freight rates of course i'm at the mercy of the carriers mm-hmm. But as far as our, our customs clearance fees um, and other, other other service fees, you know, we kept them at bay. Um, you know, unfortunately, yeah. the lines, they work inversely. Uh, the busier they are, the higher the prices go up. And my in my business mode is if I'm very busy and I'm doing very, very well, the last thing I'm going to do is increase my prices. Mm-hmm. Uh, I may increase my prices if. Um, I'm suffering, I'm losing money every month. Um, I have to increase my, my uh, service fees. The steamship lines work completely opposite. When they're very busy, they jack up the prices. And when they're very slow, they reduce their ocean freight. Yeah. So which okay. going out mentioning this. So what I believe, uh, you know, with the Chinese New Year forthcoming, it's early this year, it's in the beginning of February, um, the factories will close down. Um, you'll probably have a very, very volatile uh, spring uh, from when they uh, start production again um, and start shipping uh, merchandise into the States. Um, I foresee no no decrease in, in freight rates, probably for at least the next six to eight months. Okay, where, where are the containers and are, do they even have access to the containers to fill them back up with inventory again? Are they well, still sitting in, in the ocean over here? Well, okay, so good question. So equipment now. But just um, to preface, I'm sorry, one, one more thing just to preface. We had thousands and thousands of containers sitting in the ocean on the West Coast and I think maybe here on the East Coast as well. I always <laughs> saw West Coast pictures. And right. some of the reasons why there was backlog in supply chain is because something about the, the number of cranes that offload um, the containers were being occupied. Everything was in backlog because all the way to the point of the truckers, they didn't have enough truckers to move containers off of the lot and the lots became filled. And then the, the overcapacity of the lots prevented the cranes from being emptied off in order to pull another container off of the ship. So it was almost like a backlog starting from the human resources side of not enough truckers <laughs> to pull yeah. everything through. Well, the, the true, the, there's not enough truckers, but that's not the main, uh, the main uh, reason. So you had just an influx of vessels coming in. So for example, in the West Coast, there was um, an audit by, um, it was ordered by the president that they wanted an investigation done on the longshoremen in Los Angeles, that they were doing a work slowdown, okay? 
And it was proven that the longshoremen, in fact, were doing the work slow down. Okay. Why? They were not, they were not unloading vessels as quick as they can. Why? Well, because when you're working on a Saturday and Sunday now, okay, because you're not, you're, you're not as loading as many containers on the weekday. So now they need your services to come in on the weekend and you're getting double, you know, uh, time and a half on Saturday and double time on Sunday. You know, you're talking about individuals that are making, you know, anywhere up to $300,000 a year, you know, uh, as a, you know, a union job, which is besides the truckers union, the longshoreman's union is the most powerful union in the country. So um, it wound up being that, yes, the longshoremen were uh, doing a work slowdown. Okay. It had nothing to do with people calling in sick. Uh, they just went out unloading vessels as quick as they normally would. So vessels were staying out. So that, with, again, a shortage of truckers, um, you know, became a problem. So in Los Angeles, you had vessels that were, uh, uh, you know, uh, outside the port, just sitting outside of the port of Long Beach in the water. Um, you know, they were out there for a week to 10 days before they even birthed. And you know, once the vessel births, then of course, then they need to, you know, longshoremen need to work the vessel, take the vessels, the containers off the ship. And the next problem was, was shortage of chassis. Mm -hmm. So the chassis is the base on the back of the truck that yeah. just pulls it away. Chassis is the trailer that the container sits on with the wheels. Um, so there was a shortage of chassis. So why is there a shortage of chassis? Because I heard that many trucks were not being offloaded because they had nowhere to store the empty containers. So you had empty containers sitting on chassis that were not being offloaded because of the... Well, empty containers would never be on a chassis. Uh, empty containers would just be placed and they, they double stack, and triple stack them. They stack them as high as they can go. Um, so apparently they, the empty containers were stacked as high as they can go, but they had nowhere to go even after that because the trucks, the trucks, well, the vessels well, to take well, them back to China were still stocked well, with inventory. That's correct. There was a, um, a large amount of, of containers, empty equipment containers here stateside mm -hmm. that were not sh shipped back. So equipment was staying here and therefore causing a shortage of equipment overseas in China. Okay. Which is another, another issue as well. Um, you know, the carriers, the, uh, the amount of cargo coming into the United States versus cargo leaving the United States is the disparity is, uh, I, I couldn't even give you a percentage, but there's a, there's a large disparity. There's so more coming in than going out. Right. Um, and the container shortage over in China was also exacerbated by the fact that they were sending PPE over to countries that don't really have any need for um, for exporting stuff from their country out to China. So containers well, are yeah. also going in that direction too. So yes, China has a bit of a shortage of containers. Not just, you're right, not just the United States. Um, you know, the European market, um, you know, these PPE products, um, you know, European countries were purchasing a lot from China as well. Right. Uh, so, so it's this, a perfect storm, basically. How would you have taken? Um, how would you have taken your magic wand to have improved the process or mitigated some of the things that we're seeing now, a year and a half later? I I couldn't even tell you. I mean, you know, when factories close down and nothing's being produced. Um, you know, you're talking about, you know, a, a country, the largest manufacturing country in the world shuts down for a month, six weeks, maybe even two months for that matter. They're not producing anything. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing that anybody could have done about this. Um, the, eventually it was going to uh, you know, um, hit, hit a wall, hit a brick wall is exactly what it did. So, as I said, you know, and during the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, you know, it was business as usual. I mean, containers were coming in, the piers were okay. Boxes were getting cleared. They were getting picked up. Okay. But here's your question now. So again, container, empty container was not being shipped back out. So there was a buildup of equipment here. Okay. And it was a trickling effect. And then also China sold 
more to other countries than they normally would. I mean, you look at the, the you know, the PPE products, um, you know, that they were using uh, other countries, not just Europe, other countries as well. Um, so there was equipment being shipped all over the place, which normally was not the case. Yeah. Um, Do you think that the government stepping in and helping out at the port uh, did anything? And actually, what did I, what what did they do? Actually, I, what were I the not, I do not. I just think it's a matter of um, things are getting caught up a bit now. OK, um, it's not uh, equipment is repositioning itself back overseas. The carriers have to reposition containers um, and it's 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 calming down the only thing that's not coming down is the ocean freight rates ocean freight rates are going to continue to escalate only because of the chinese government chinese government the american government needs to go to the chinese government and control this in, in a better fashion because otherwise it's just it's just taking money out of americans uh pockets yeah, you know, I mean, it, it's very easy to raise but, rates and it's very hard for rates to come down in any business. Cost of, cost of consumer goods, crazy. Why is fuel a uh, gallon of high test $3.90 a gallon? Okay, we have more fuel reserve in this country than anywhere else in the world. Okay, mm -hmm. I don't pipelines. These are the lobbyists in Washington. Why is, it, why is a gallon of milk, you know, $3.99, okay? Why is beef $20 a pound? Why is there a shortage of cottage cheese now in the United States? Okay. Is there a shortage of cottage cheese? I thought it was cream cheese, but- oh. Cream, I apologize. I don't well, eat- cream, cream cheese, okay, fine. That's uh, fine. I love okay. my cottage cheese. Why not ask, <laughs> but it's, yes, why is, it, why is it that expensive? Yeah. You know, when you and say, it, you know, it, there's no reason right now people aren't traveling. You know, if they're traveling, they're flying. Uh, you still people that are driving, but there's there's no reason that fuel gasoline should be the price that it is. Um, you know, the, and the, the whole all these things really um, exposed human behavior, of course, for, you know, well, what do we think is going to be scarce? What's there going to be a run on? Um, let's go. I have a 40 pound bag of rice in my closet that I bought at the beginning of the pandemic just because I didn't know. I, I wanted to make sure that there was something sustainable to, you know, to feed the family, like rice and beans. There's a defensive product. Beans. Yeah, definitely. But um, the, the whole pandemic itself, you saw the run on certain products, but then you also saw how vulnerable we are to, um, to manufacturing outside of the U.S., so I've had many conversations um, with people about manufacturing what, what I do, the Throbies, inside the U.S., but it would be twice, if not three times more expensive, even, even including the shipping and everything because of the raw materials. Like you, if you look back to raw materials, it's likely that some of the raw materials will come from China anyway or from overseas. Who produces polyester in the United States? China, <laughs> the the origins Nobody, of the thread yeah, and all of that is, not, you know, maybe cotton. You have some producers of cotton here in the United States because it's, you know, it's a natural product. And but polyester, there's, nobody's producing polyester in the United States. So yeah, that's. Do you, that, um, do you think manufacturing will at all be reborn in the United States? Any of these? I, I know that um, the people that can make it happen are probably the larger businesses like the Amazons and the Targets and the Walmarts, but the incentive for them to create any sort of infrastructure in the United States for manufacturing might be very low because they know that they can, they can pull the strings and pull together what they pulled now and they can grab their own, you know, ships and liners and, and put their containers on there and get it where it needs to go. Cause they're the big, well, I, I don't think I don't, I don't see the United States being a manufacturing powerhouse that we were once were. Um, so the vulnerabilities that were exposed are, I guess, worth it for the cheaper prices, maybe. Yeah, well, it's 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 well, China China is no longer. Um, it's not it, it's not cheap to manufacture merchandise any longer in China. The uh, China has become very westernized. 
uh, there are still many, many factory workers that do not work. Uh, they'd rather not work for the wage they're getting from the factories. Um, and they'll stay, you know, and collect assistance from the Chinese government. Um, they, uh, so prices are, have been, you know, are driven up. So the combination of the cost of manufacturing in China and these escalating freight rates, um, you know, that's the reason. The freight rates is the primary reason. But of course, with the cost of manufacturing goods going up, that doesn't help any either. I personally do not believe um, especially under this leadership that we have now, uh, without getting into politics. Uh, I think uh, President Trump, if there was any president that was going to um, uh, institute more manufacturing in the United States was Donald Trump. Uh, he imposed all these tariff, China tariffs, uh, merchandise coming into the United States to try to make it not attractive to import from China. But that did not do anything. I mean, I mean to was... the detriment of people who currently manufacture in China, it, because there were no other options. It, that would be one thing if you laid the yeah. infrastructure for manufacturing in the United States prior to cutting oh, off. Things. It takes a while. It takes a long time. True, you know, but if you if you if you make it, if you bottleneck it, unfortunately, as an American, red, white, and blue, the unions killed. The manufacturing sector in the United States. Yeah. So I will, I, unless we get that going again for manufacturing, I don't think that, you know, making it more costly, because if Trump was going to have more, um, make it more costly to import stuff, it's very similar to the way that the people on the other side in China are making it more costly to, to secure, a, you know, a container. Just, yeah. I mean, I, I, I could tell you the story, and I use this as an example. And I think we, every one of us has one of these on our desk one way or another, a swing line stapler. So X amount of years ago, I read an article in New York Times that the owners of swing line institution, by the way, um, went to their workers and said, look, we can't compete with the Chinese market right now. This is what it's costing us per employee. We need to reduce your wages, benefits, so on and so forth. The union disagreed factory closed up, moved all their operation overseas to China. Okay. It, there's the fall. Yeah. Well, I mean, of course you can't yeah. just reduce someone's wages. You have to create a living environment for them. So well, say for example, on military bases, military bases are like even their own little um, microcosm of a community. They have a little shopping center. They have a little bowling alley, a little movie theater on the military base for that are that's priced substantially lower than if you were to go to your local mall and go see a movie. So creating a manufacturing hub would require creating a little ecosystem and a community that is, you know, that has cost of living, maybe a third of what it is outside of the, that little hub in well, order the to other, pay the those base, wages. They're not paying. And, and people will say alcohol, tobacco products, that are purchased on the, these bases, it's a reduced cost because the government's not imposing excise taxes on these items, excise taxes. I have friends of mine that are veterans and you know, they're drinkers, they're smokers, and they'll go to the, um, you know, I, f I forgot what the name, what they call it, but, and they can get you know, a carton of cigarettes for X amount of dollars or a bottle of booze, whatever, for X amount of dollars. And it's because of the excise tax. Um, and where somebody like you and I brought it in or uh, an importer of, uh, you know, of tobacco products is gonna pay a very, very high uh, uh, yeah. syntax, they say. Sure, uh, sure. but that's dude. an example of the micro, micro um, community, the microcosm that's being yeah, created. Yeah. But they're not gonna have it here. Listen, manufacturing in the United States, it takes a long, long time. Yeah. You know, years ago when Vietnam was opening up, and everybody said Vietnam was going to be the next powerhouse, manufacturing powerhouse in the world. Uh, Burma, for example, as well. Uh, and I said, do you know how long it's going to take? OK, the government is going to need to invest a lot of money, um, produce, you know, building these uh, factories, educating these people, uh, training them. OK, China has been doing this for quite some time and they have the stranglehold on everything.
mm-hmm. uh, and it never Vietnam never developed. I mean, there they do a big uh, there's a, a lot of seafood that's um, you know frozen seafood that comes from Vietnam into the United States, but you do not see anywhere near the amount of goods uh, manufactured you know uh, in Vietnam like they do in China. Uh, it's very 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 uh, few. Um, and all these other countries as well. So uh, until China will be continue to be the powerhouse, uh, I believe the American government needs to uh, get together with the Chinese government and we need to get more control over this. And, and to be honest with you, it, it's, it's extortion at its finest. Mm. It's uh, base, base allocation fee is nothing but, as they call it, tea back money in China. It's tea, it's money that's given under the table. Now, years ago, it was a common practice. So where uh, a shipping line or uh, a freight forwarder would go over to an export manager in a factory, let's say in a factory that exported 3000 containers a year, you know, all over the world, or maybe even the United States. And they went to the export manager and they said, listen, on all of your prepaid shipments, okay, where the factory sells the freight to customer A in the United States, inclusive of the ocean freight. Mm -hmm. If you give us all your containers to move for us, every container will give you tea back $100 a load. Okay. So to be an export manager in these factories in China was a very lucrative position. Your, Your base salary was nothing. You could care less about your base salary. It was all under the table money, tea back money is what they refer to it as. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing now, only 5,000% more. So is there a difference between CNF and FOB at this point? Like with what you just said, it prepaid containers with the shipping already built in. Maybe that's CNF. A lot of factories now, normally when they wanted to um, control the freight, because factories, not only were they making money prior to the pandemic on selling the material, they were also making money on the ocean freight as well. So mm-hmm. you know, they had contracts with, with carriers, let's say for $3,000, they were building in the cost of the ocean freight into the cost of the material by say $4,000, mm-hmm. okay? So you as a normal importer and say, look, I really don't wanna be bothered with, you know, having, you know, getting a logistics company, it's one-stop shopping, I'm gonna purchase this product, the factory is going to ship it, and this is how much the unit price is going to be. That's C and F. Okay, so a lot of the factories now, because uh, companies are entering into contracts, C and F contract prices, um, the 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 shipping companies or the manufacturers, because the uh, the escalating rates they are continuously moving, um, the factories. If they did a CNF price at say, you know, a container freight rate of ten thousand uh, dollars, and now all of a sudden it's thirteen thousand dollars, and they entered into a contract, the factories are, you know, if it's a reputable factory, they're going to cover the additional cost themselves. Okay, so now because of the escalating rates and the uncertainty, the factories now are telling importers, we're not doing CNF terms. Mm-hmm. We'll do F. You will sell your merchandise. You have, we'll get freight on board. Okay, but you take care of the freight charges. Yourself. So if the freight rates go up to $20,000, it doesn't affect us. We entered into a contract with you for a container of widgets, okay, for $10,000. And if the freight rates go up, it doesn't matter. Our, our contract is 10000 your freight rates, you're going to have to deal with it directly with your carrier. Okay. So if you, you can see. get a CNF price, that's probably your best way on my side, on an oh, importer side to mitigate. Well, come come oh, a little closer okay. to the phone because yeah. you're chopping out. There you go. Protecting, protecting you. Because if you, like I said, you go into contract, um, you know, uh, at a CNF price at, you know, 35 cents a unit and it's inclusive of the ocean freight and freight rates go up 200%. Um, if they're going to honor their contract, you're not going to pay any more money on it. Right. So I have a client of mine, for example, he is a, um, an importer of uh, coconut waters uh, from Thailand into the United States, into the New York area. He entered into a contract uh, with this factory. He, he probably purchases three, 400 containers a year from this uh, producer. 
Um, and he entered into a contract. And the freight rates, believe it or not, are about $3,700 a container for a 20 foot from Thailand, which is normally about $17,000. Mm-hmm. So my point is, his, his contract is, uh, is coming due uh, this coming April. And my client is very, very concerned that when the contract is up and the factory tells him that you're going to, you know, we're not going to do CNF anymore. You're going to do FOB. And if the freight rates from Thailand are still $17,000, his uh, cost of this material is going to go through the roof. Mm-hmm. And, but I told him, I said, you're very lucky that the factory honored right. the contract. Okay. Um, when the freight rates, and it does not matter how many containers this factory ships to the United States, the carriers were, you know, were still imposing these fees to everybody. I don't care how large or small you are. And again, going back, why the Walmarts and the Home Depots of the world, why they were chartering their own vessels, because they were getting subject to this as well. Nobody was getting any free rides, unfortunately. So, yeah, you think they would have already had long term contracts? If anybody prevented them, going to get the rates to be held as is was going to be again the the uh the the walmarts of the world mm-hmm. uh, um the, the the yeah the walmarts of the world um or the home depots so yeah. um i think um you know as i said in closure i think the you know the the uncertainty of freight rates is still going to be an issue mm-hmm. um i think we're going to um it's going to be this way for quite some time. What are some things that we could, um, what's the best case scenario? Should I place orders in March and try and pin my factory to giving me a CNF rate? Or um, should I wait until end of summer to see how things go and then still pin my factory to giving me a CNF rate? Uh, if, you wait, um, if you wait to the end of summer, you know you know what's going to happen. You're still going to have the uh, peak season surcharge. You're going to have holiday merchandise for next year or for this year. Um, You know, September, October, historically, is a very, very, uh, very, very active shipping season. So um, I if I was an importer myself, I would negotiate the freight rates with the manufacturer inclusive of the freight charges. Okay. Sienna. Yep. Uh, um, Because. I personally don't think that the freight rates are going to be going down any, you know, if it was, you know, it's a crapshoot, you know, what do you do? You're going to enter with the contract. What if I enter a contract that, you know, um, you know, $50 a unit based on a very, very high freight rate. And then, you know, two months from now, freight rates bottom out and they're very, very cheap. So you're saying, oh my God, I'm, I, you know, I entered into a contract, you know, uh, but I don't think they're going to come down any, I think you're, you, um, you know, you need to protect yourself. Uh, but again, this is factories will, which will do CNF. I, I, I see so much more uh, freight charges coming and collect um, now mm-hmm. uh, than ever before. Yeah. Uh, the, the well, pre- I guess CNF is going to be the best hedge out there for the time being. Um, 100. What about uh, time frames? Usually it was you'd allow 90 days manufacturing time in the factory and then about 30 to 45 days on the water for the container. Are you still seeing 30 to 45 days until people? Uh, yeah, transit time East Coast is 40 days. Um, vessels are coming in into more terminal Port Newark. They are, um, you know, they could be coming in a couple of days, sitting outside the port, wait, waiting, you know, for the vessel to be worked. Uh, East Coast is uh, definitely unloading containers uh, quicker than the West Coast. And it's also, there's a lot more volume on the West Coast than there's East Coast. There always has been. So is um, it cleared up? Is the congestion cleared up? The, the numbers that you just gave are not, pretty... Not as bad as it was. I mean, it's bad, but it's not as bad as it was. East so Coast. They're not sitting on the water for more than 10 days now? Um, I mean, I, listen, there's, I'm not going to say that there's not containers sitting on the vessel for 10 days. I mean, I, I live by the water. I mean, I, I saw over the summertime, I saw vessels on, on a Saturday afternoon sitting out on the water. I'd be riding my bicycle and I'd, I'd see 15 vessels waiting to come into the terminal, into, you know, uh, Port Newark or Mar Terminal. Uh, normally, I would never see that ever. Uh, do I see that now? No. Um, I'm not in Long Beach. I really couldn't answer that 
correctly, but I only know from when we get documentation and we track a shipment and if it says it's arrival uh, January 4th, um, you know, we see sometimes maybe it's a week, you know, so the container becomes available. Um, so West Coast, normal transit time is, is, is 14 days, 15 days. Conservatively, I would say 23 days as a transit time from mainland China to West Coast. East Coast, I would say, uh, you know, 28, 30 days normal, tack on another seven to eight days uh, just for delay. So you're looking 38 to 40 days for transit time to the East Coast. Okay. And how about trucking? Once once it does get here, is uh, what to allow well, for trucking? Make one other mention where there is a major, major problem is the rail moves. Cargo rail? that's going in. Yeah, rail is just an absolute joke right now. The the uh, We have containers that are coming into the East Coast and that are some of them are taking two to three weeks to even be put on a rail car to go to say for example to chicago okay um it's crazy hmm. uh, so um the the um transit time on on those moves are extraordinarily high you know the the amount of days is is crazy so okay. And uh, what about air? Are people did did people turn to air freight, or air freight just became so expensive that it was a, a joke? Because I know it was air always probably four times more expensive. Insane. During the height of the pandemic, when we were doing these PPE products, these masks, um, initially people needed masks. There was there was no masks. Uh, Obviously, hand sanitizers, even if you were able to bring it in, the factory was approved by Food and Drug. You couldn't put hand sanitizers on, on, a, on a plane anyway because it's, it's considered a, you know, hazardous material or um, you know, there's chemicals in it. It's explosive. Um, you know, the alcohol that's, that's contained in the hand sanitizers. But the face masks, they were all coming in uh, via plane. Uh, you know, transit time sets the price you know when two days transit uh, of course being the highest and you had your you know around the world in 80 days uh transit time which was cheaper uh you know it could take two weeks for a flight you know to get into jfk from from china um hmm. the days the only individuals that are shipping uh air freight or if samples are needed Mm -hmm. perishable goods so for example we handle uh you know a lot of uh, fresh truffles uh, from italy they come in well al italian went out of business so delta airlines has taken over that route so you know it's an expensive item there's no there's no way to ship it other than via air you can't ship a product like that uh via you know uh, ocean freight mm -hmm. so uh, that's always opted for air though anyway fresh perishable Mm -hmm. A lot of fresh vegetables and such flowers, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, roses, uh, tulips. And has uh, air freight gone up hundred uh, percent, two hundred? Wait, what is it? A thousand percent? Yeah, well? air freight is air freight is very very high right now. Um, okay. You know, we our normal clients are, you know, uh, if they're bringing heavy heavy material, they're not shipping in the air. They're bringing in containers. There is no, uh, we just had a client that brought in some prayer rugs for um, a prison. Oh, okay. And, yeah, he spent $5,000 extra and, you know, to get it in in a quicker transit time. Okay. Uh, because they need it. All right. Uh, um, ramen, whatever. So a lot of kids in college are actually choosing supply chain as a major. It's, um, it's a specialization of study now. Is that something that you see as an industry where the up and coming minds definitely need to carve something else out for the traditional methods that have been used? Absolutely. So it's yeah. a good yeah. Then. The Amazons of the world are going to be looking for people that have, you know, specialized, sharp logistics people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's definitely the, uh, the way of the future for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe when I grow up, I'll go into logistics. I, on the other hand, 
I am done with logistics. You're done. What's I, your next career move? Um, I'm going to become a male stripper. Sounds good. <laughs> Stick with at logistics, the, or at least make your money at, now. At the tender age of 58, I won't be <laughs> put on the table. Uh, no, I'm, I, uh, the, today's uh, logistics world, I, I tell people that uh, if I was entering into this business today, I would, as quick as I walked in the door, I'd run right out. It just, the, the industry is nowhere near like it was. Um, is it I'm, only I'm, because the antiquated systems and the practices or you, because now you're saying supply chain and logistics is definitely a smart path for the it is. It's very diluted. The industry is very diluted. So uh, there were many, you know, 20, 30 years ago, there were a lot of mom and pop operations like myself. Um, the, the large, you know, the UPSs. Um, they took a lot of uh, logistics and freight forwarders and customs brokers over. Uh, UPS, for example, bought out all the brokers along the Canadian border. Mm -hmm. uh, so they control everything that comes in from Canada to the United States. One way or another, you know, uh, UPS is involved. In. Okay. Uh, the um, uh, FedEx, um, you know, again, we all, you know, if you see the commercials on for United Postal Service, we are logistics. You know, the, the UPSs of the world now, they just, you know, they just don't want to deliver envelopes anymore. They're, you know, they're moving container freight. Sure. Um, plus, you know, with Amazon, um, you know, it's there's just so much more, it's so much more lucrative for them. Um, but the, the competitiveness in this industry, um, is 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 fierce um yeah. there's uh, there's there's no profit uh, profit margin and i look at industries that uh service fees have gone up like you asked me earlier if my fees been adjusted unfortunately i haven't adjusted my service fees in almost 11 years mm -hmm. okay um i i do okay i stand by my client uh, i i provide a good service for a, a valued rate um, but unfortunately with so much competition, uh, you know, the, the, the saying is I go ahead, raise my prices. I have people, you know, clients as, as loyal as you think they are, they're out the door and, and, you right. know, and two going to somebody else because right. I'm getting prices. Yeah. Uh, years ago, you didn't have that, you know, you didn't have as many people as you have now. It's, it's, it's so diluted now. Yeah. So, well, I know a lot of the companies ended up absorbing all their logistics instead of using outside parties, outside third parties, like, like your shop, they absorbed it all to in-house corporate. So QVC has their own logistics group that handles correct. all of the import export clearing when, customs. Yeah. Um, no, they, they, don't, you know, they don't even uh, want me to handle any of it on the outside because they have the economies yeah. of scale and the people that the infrastructure that's already there. Yeah, they'll go out and hire a guy like me, a licensed customer broker. Yep. They'll pay him a decent salary and they'll say, you run the whole import operations and we don't need to deal with logistics companies or customer brokers any longer. Right. And chances are that might be a good next step for you too. But um, chances are it, you would be provided with all of the latest technology so you can see real time where the shipment is on the water, what the contents is, what the this, what the that. All of the um, technology surrounded, surrounding this industry has also been improved to give you know more insight as to the moment by moment. Um, I don't want to work in logistics. I want to go on QVC with you and sell dog like <laughs> We'll see if I can arrange that. Kona Bellinis. Kona by way, Benelli. <laughs> Bellinis, I have referred to it as. And by the way, nobody doesn't know. Kona was Jess's dog. Unfortunately, <laughs> no longer with us. Yes. But I still remember, I still remember Kona. Yes, so. I appreciate that. You you definitely remember a lot of things about my God business. Bless. What's that? I said, God bless Kona. God bless Kona. And God bless you for having gotten a dog and realizing the love of a dog. Cause I know that you, you just can't move without your dog. Ultimate friend. Man, really are best. The best. Yeah, absolutely. Now I know why the pet industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Never. People want to comfort and, and primp and do everything that they can food and, and shelter and everything they can to the nines for their best friend. The, you know, people that abuse animals should go straight to hell, but people that love animals love their animals. Truly. I am a preferred customer of, of, uh, what's the big mail order pet place. Uh, um, one, eight hundred. Oh, Chewy. No, we're a preferred, I'm a preferred client of Chewy. There's, there's at least one or two Chewy boxes coming to my house once a week. You know why? Because they have good logistics. Well, because at the time when my dog was eating dog food and then it was a 25 pound bag of kibble, uh, they would deliver it and they would put it right in front, in front of the front door. My wife wouldn't have to carry it and throw it in the car. That's right. What are you making your wife carry it and throw it in the car anyway in real life? Come on. <laughs> I'm going to run now. Okay. Are we finished? That we was are a finished. Thank, Thank you, you very for- much, as always, for all of your yeah. insight. I'm going to go and strong arm my China manufacturer into giving me CNF pricing That's that I can handle. Good luck. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Enjoy your day. Thank you. You as well. Bye-bye. Bye.